Welcome to World War I Centennial News, episode number 80. Thank you so much for joining us. And I also want to let you know that you can now find us on Twitter at the WW1 Podcast. That's how you can ask us questions, make comments, get links from the show that you might have missed, or have us drop a note to one of our guests on your behalf. That's at the T H E W W the number one podcast. Because, of course, it's more than just a show. It's a conversation about the events 100 years ago this week and the World War I centennial commemoration happening now about the war that changed the world. This week... We're going to explore the relationship we've had with France, really since the birth of our nation. The war in the sky is going to remind us of a great tragedy a hundred years ago this week. Dr. Edward Lengel tells us about some American soldiers now known, and with good reason, as the Rock of the Marne. Mike Schuster shares the stories of some familiar names now in harm's way. Deborah Dudak helps us get started with how to find our ancestors who served 100 years ago. Bill Payne, Vince Bono, and Lisa Polay present the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials Project from Saugerties, New York. And The Buzz, where Catherine Akey highlights the commemoration of World War I in social media. World War I Centennial News is brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the Star Foundation. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist for the Commission and your host. Welcome to the show. Now, just a couple of weeks after the 4th of July, when America celebrates its Declaration of Independence from the British Empire, we're at July 14th, which is France's Independence Day. And a lot happened on both the 4th of July and on the 14th of July, a hundred years ago this month, as the two nations recognized and celebrated their relationship and their friendship. So, Franco-American relationship is our theme for this week's history segment. We're going to take a look at how we honored and frustrated each other, and we thought we might even set our centennial time machine to take a little deeper dive and touch on our relationship where it started, at the very birth of our nation, as we explore Franco-American relations a hundred years ago this week and more. We've gone back in time just a little over 240 years. It's 1775. And a young upstart group of colonies in the New World are railing against their sovereign king. Now they insist that they will not continue to pay financial tribute to a government if they do not have a voice in how they're being governed. You know, the old no taxation without representation thing. Well, the crown takes great umbrage at these snot-nosed little colonists who simply do not seem to get that they belong to the British Empire and that the imperial crown is their sovereign ruler. What's wrong with these guys? They clearly need to be reminded of who's boss. Well, that doesn't work out so well. And you know what these crazy guys do? They fight back. And even crazier, within a year, They rationalize their whole position about the rights of regular people, you know, like not nobility kind of people, and they declare themselves independent from the crown on July 4th, 1776. Unbelievable. Well, I mean, that's nice, but no question. The crown is about to hand them their butts in a bag, except that these American colonists have this big buddy with some clout and an army and a navy a friend with some history and some current colonial issues with the British Empire. This is France. And in 1778, they make a treaty of alliance with the Americans, which essentially finances America's fight for its independence. And that's the birth of a long and mostly tight friendship. (laughs) The real story is actually a lot more complicated and convoluted than that, but that's the gist of it. But it's only the beginning. 
Okay, let's jump forward in time about 10 years to 1789. And it's now the French people who decide to declare their own independence from their crown in a pretty unambiguous and definite way using something called a guillotine. I mean, this idea that people not descended from royals are the foundation of government for the governed is a bigger American export than blue jeans, jazz, or the iPhone. Well, maybe not the iPhone, but we can talk about that. But you know, if you think about it, isn't that just a huge part of what's happening 100 years ago in the war that changed the world? It's the end of empires. So the U.S. Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776, from the British, and the French storming of the Bastille 13 years later on July 14th, 1789, against their royals, and this life and death World War struggle for freedom from the Imperial Kaiser 129 years later in 1918, well, they're all kind of woven together into a really important relationship with our French friends. Dateline, July 15, 1918. A headline in the New York Times reads, All hail France and mighty tribute on Bastille Day. Nations homage voiced at meeting which packs Madison Square Garden. Wilson sends greetings. And the story reads, America and all the myriad peoples whose blood mingles to make the American nation last night voiced their homage to France at the great meeting at Madison Square Garden. This closed New York City's celebration of Bastille Day. All day, the salutes of warships in the harbor, the formal military and naval ceremonials at forts, naval stations, and training camps, special services in honor of France and the French spirit of liberty in many churches. Open-air meetings in the afternoon. Feats of flying performed in the air over the city by French and American aviators. All these had gone into New York City's celebration of the national holiday of France, the anniversary of the fall of the Bastille, which marked the beginning of French liberty. But these were of minor importance compared to the meeting last night, where the presence of 12,000 persons, including distinguished speakers, and the ambassadors of leading allies, and the Secretary of the Navy representing President Wilson, all paid tribute to France. The American speakers talked of Lafayette, of Romachot, of de Grasse, of France, which had held out her hand to a young and struggling United States striving for liberty. In the article, France's Generalissimo Foch, the supreme commander of Allied forces in Europe, and normally a pretty severe critic of General Pershing's, sent this cablegram message. We are celebrating today the anniversary of our independence, and we are fighting today for the independence of the entire world. After four years of struggle, the plans of the enemy for domination are stopped. He sees the number of his adversaries increasing each day, and the young American army brings into the battle a valor and a faith without equal. Is this not a sure pledge of the definitive triumph of the just cause? 125 years ago today, the Bastille fell. The dust rose so high in the air that it could be seen from every capital in the world. Some despotic rulers understood the meaning. Some did not. Just a few of the latter sort still remain. The day when they shall understand and shall disappear themselves, a remnant of an abolished past, is not far off. When the Bastille fell, after a while, the dust cleared away. Nothing was to be seen of the old fortress, and what struck the sight was another emblematic monument representing the new ideal of a new age, whose motto is liberty, equality, fraternity. Well, well said, General Foch. And that's the end of our story this week. So on behalf of my fellow Americans, please join us in wishing happy birthday to our French friends and may our bonds endure through the ages.
And that brings us to the war in the sky, with one of the most dramatic moments of this time, making news everywhere, both at home and overseas. Dateline, Paris, July 17, 1918. A headline of the New York Times reads, Lieutenant Roosevelt falls in air fight, believed killed. Quentin's plane tumbles down inside the enemy lines in Marne battle. Colonel Roosevelt and wife accept with fortitude the fate of their youngest son. Lieutenant Quentin Roosevelt, youngest son of the former president, has been killed in an air fight. It is stated that his machine fell into the enemy lines. Lieutenant Roosevelt was last seen in combat on Sunday morning with two enemy airplanes about 10 miles inside the German lines in the Chateau Thierry sector. He started out with a patrol of 13 American machines. They encountered seven Germans and were chasing them back when two of them turned on Lieutenant Roosevelt. Reports of the fight state that the Germans appeared to be shooting at the lieutenant from the rear, the three machines being close together. Then one of the machines was seen tumbling through the clouds, and a patrol, which went in search of Lieutenant Roosevelt, returned without a trace of him. He appeared to be fighting up to the last moment. One account of the combat states that the machine caught fire before it began to fall. Another report says that Roosevelt's plane was not in flames when it went down. Philip Roosevelt, Quentin's cousin, is said to have witnessed the air battle in the vicinity of Chateau Thierry in which Quentin was engaged and saw the machine fall, but did not know until later that the airplane was that of his cousin, the journal said today. Sadly, the story is true. Quentin Roosevelt, the beloved youngest son of the former president, is killed this week, a hundred years ago, in the war in the sky. The fighting for Americans is in full gear, as you'll hear during our segment, America Emerges, military stories from World War I with Dr. Edward Langle. Ed's story this week tells of turning points, showdowns, attacks, abandonments, determination, heroism, and in contrast to the official goodwill between the French and the American allies, what might have been a friendly fire incident involving a poodle. The tide of World War I changed permanently 100 years ago in July 1918, when General Erich Ludendorff launched another German offensive along the Marne River. Facing him in the front lines east of Chateau Thierry were several tired French infantry divisions and elements of two American divisions. For the 28th Division, Pennsylvania National Guard, it was to be a baptism of fire. For the 3rd Division, the Marne River defense would be a supreme trial of strength. Controversy over French conduct, though, would result in the accidental shooting of a French officer by an American bullet. Ludendorff's offensive was named Operation Marneschutz Reims. Its objective was to shatter French defenses along the Marne River and force a diversion of reserves that would allow the Germans to launch a fresh offensive further north that might drive the British Army to the sea. The French, however, knew that the Germans were coming thanks to intelligence revelations from multiple sources. French Generalissimo Ferdinand Foch planned to stop the Germans cold on July 15th and then, three days later, launch a major offensive toward Soissons, led by the American 1st and 2nd Divisions. First, though, the American 3rd and 28th Divisions would need to work with French forces to beat back the Germans east of Chateau Thierry. The Americans were eager to fight, but not alongside the French. The men of the 3rd Division served under French Corps commander whom they despised, General Jean de Mondesir, who demanded that they crowd their forces along the front in tactics that 3rd Division Commander General Joseph T. Dickman regarded as, quote, a violation of fundamental principles and utterly erroneous. To the east, the 28th Division had it worse. Instead of fighting as a unit, the Pennsylvanians were broken up by companies embedded in the French 125th Infantry Division, a shaky outfit, as events would prove. The German attack was planned for the early morning hours of July 15th. Forewarned, American and French artillery pounded the German infantry before they could even leave their trenches. German artillery responded effectively, however, smashing American 3rd Division outposts along the riverbank. Just before zero hour, the Germans saturated the riverbank with sneezing gas, followed by poison gas. 
the idea being that the sneezing gas would make it impossible for the defenders to keep their masks on. But the Americans were well drilled and had prepared their masks well in advance. When German infantry surged across the river on boats and pontoons, the Americans opened a withering fire. German infantry took severe casualties but stormed the riverbank. Americans of the 7th and 30th regiments fought them hand-to-hand -hand as they landed, and fighting surged across a railroad embankment and along the heights overlooking the river. Lieutenant William Ryan of the 30th Regiment remembered, Directly in front of us and down by the railroad, I could see German infantrymen wearing overcoats, coming straight toward us in approach formation similar to that used by our army. As they approached up the hill, they dropped out of sight until they drew close to us. The German infantry and machine gunners came on at a slow walk, as steady as though on a drill ground. An officer at the head of them was swinging a walking stick. Some American platoons were cut off and fought to the last man. Others had to pull back. An unlikely act of heroism at the village of Mezzi finally broke the back of the German assault. Captain Jesse Walton Woolridge of the 3rd Division's 38th Regiment, now also drawn into the fighting, held on to the village with elements of two companies and every other man he could get his hands on, including a trench mortar battery that had run out of ammunition, as well as cooks, clerks, and runners. German grenadiers attacked with heavy weapons supported by machine guns and aircraft. Just as the enemy prepared their final assault on the village, however, Woolridge led his men in a surprise counterattack that shocked and routed the grenadiers. It's God's truth, the captain exulted, that one company of American soldiers beat and routed a full regiment of picked shock troops of the German army. Just to the east, four companies of the 28th Division's 109th and 110th Regiments underwon an awful ordeal. As soon as the German attack began, the French 125th Division withdrew from its positions along the Jalgon Bend. They might have had good reasons for doing so, however, they neglected to tell the Americans of their plans and simply left them behind in isolated outposts. Green though they were, the doughboys stuck to their own orders and held on. They were wiped out. The 3rd Division's brave defense of the Marne River was to earn it the well-deserved epithet Rock of the Marne. Although the Germans made some progress here and to the east against the 28th and 125th Divisions, by the time evening fell, Ludendorff knew that his attack was a failure. Unbeknownst to him, Foch was about to launch a counterstroke. But there was a legacy of bitterness. Furious at being forced to take unnecessary casualties by defending from the waterline, instead of employing a flexible defense, General Dickman and his staff denounced the French and urged General Pershing to place them under American command. The 28th Division doughboys and officers were even more upset. At one point, a French officer who appeared at the front carrying a poodle during the fighting was shot in the back by an unidentified doughboy. The dog survived. The American authorities immediately declared the incident an accident and declined to investigate. Dr. Edward Lengel is an American military historian and our segment host for America Emerges, military stories from World War I. We put links in the podcast notes to Ed's post and his author's website. And that brings us to Mike Schuster, former NPR correspondent and the curator for the Great War Project blog. Mike, your post this week turns focus a bit and considers how this devastating war in Europe influenced the experience and the worldview of some names quite well known today, figures who in turn influenced the thinking of generations since. Your post brings in names like Hemingway, Faulkner, Eliot, Cummings, Stein, and more. That's right, Teo. So our headlines read, Hemingway in Italy, Dos Passos in France, writers, even teenagers, take to the war, a farewell to arms. And this is special to the Great War Project. The young Ernest Hemingway will experience the war firsthand. The 18-year-old American takes a job as a Red Cross ambulance driver on the Italian front, where in the first days of July a century ago, the Allies take 3,000 Austrian troops prisoner. According to historian Martin Gilbert, Hemingway is the second American to be hit on the Italian front, wounded by an Austrian mortar shell on the night of July 8th while handing out chocolate to Italian soldiers in a dugout. He was awarded the Italian Silver Medal of Military Valor and taken to a hospital in Milan. 
This is a peach of a hospital, he reported. There are about 18 nurses to take care of four patients. One of the best surgeons in Milan is looking after my wounds. Hemingway was hit several times by shell fragments in the back and leg. The Italian soldier who was standing next to him was killed. According to the American account of the incident, before taking care of himself, Hemingway rendered generous assistance to the Italian soldiers more seriously wounded by the same shell explosion. Years later, he will use these experiences in what became his classic novel of the war, A Farewell to Arms. Ernest Hemingway is not the only American literary figure to participate in the war. Novelist John Dos Passos also served as an ambulance driver in France, as did the poet E.E. E. Cummings. Novelist William Faulkner joined the Canadian Air Force. Poet T.S. Eliot tried to enlist but was rejected. He was judged physically unfit. The novelist Edith Wharton, according to a story in Gary Mead, was in France when the war broke out. She established and funded the American Hostel for Refugees, and she set up the Children of Flanders Refugee Fund. The writer Gertrude Stein also wrote about her experiences as an ambulance driver for the American Fund for French Wounded in her book, The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. These experiences on the part of young literary figures usually took place when there was little or no organized program to participate in the war. By the summer a century ago, the flood of soldiers has swept past the contribution of individual writers. By the beginning of July 1918, writes historian Martin Gilbert, a million American troops were in France. Their supplies were entering French ports at a rate of 20,000 tons a day. On July 1st, showing great bravery and tenacity, American troops attacked the village of Vaux. Information provided by a local stonemason helped them take the village with a minimum of loss. On July 4th, a century ago, American troops were in action at the River Sum once again alongside the Australians. They seized more than a mile of French territory lost to them at previous battles at the Somme. Nearly 1,500 Germans were taken prisoner. Reports historian Gilbert, it was during this attack that the first airborne supply of troops in battle took place when British aircraft dropped 100,000 rounds of ammunition to the Australian machine gunners below. The Allies are seizing the initiative. And that's some of the news from the Great War Project a century ago. Mike Schuster is the curator for the Great War Project blog. The link to his post is in the podcast notes. And for those of you interested in how World War I influenced literature and scholarly writing in World War I, we have a blog site dedicated to that very subject at www.cc.org slash write. That's W-W-R-I-T-E. You can also request the link via Twitter at the WW1 podcast. That's it for 100 years ago this week. It's time to fast forward into the present with World War I Centennial News Now. This part of the podcast focuses on now and how we're commemorating the centennial of World War I. In commission news, this past Friday, July 13, the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission announced a new $1.8 million World War I education program that brings together National History Day, the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, and the National World War I Museum and Memorial. The exciting initiative is aimed at both teachers as well as students through a series of over 100 planned educational events nationwide. Introducing the new partnership, U.S. World War I Centennial Commissioner Dr. Libby O'Connell stated, The Commission is committed to educating the public about World War I, and we're very excited that these incredible partners are joining with us to help educate Americans regarding the Great War. Dr. Tim Bailey, Director of Education for the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, shares the enthusiasm. Quote, as an organization dedicated to supporting American history education, we are honored to expand our relationship with the World War I Centennial Commission, and we're confident that this partnership will help advance the knowledge and understanding of the impact that World War I plays across our nation's history. Kathy Gorn, Executive Director of National History Day, agreed. 
It is a privilege to join the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission Educational Partnership and to help educate 6th to 12th grade students from all over the country about a war that changed the world. We're excited to work with the Commission and the other partners to create resources for students and teachers that delve into the history of World War I. This week in our Remembering Veterans segment, so often at the Commission, we're contacted with questions about how to learn more about a family member who served in the war. Doing genealogical research has been made much easier since the advent of the internet, but major challenges still remain, especially when you're looking for information from a century ago. Today, we're joined by Deborah M. Dudak. Deborah is with the Fountaindale Public Library in Bolingbrook, Illinois. Importantly, she's also the author of The World War I Genealogy Research Guide, Tracing American Military and Noncombatant Ancestors. Her book is available as an ebook and in paperback, both on Amazon.com. Deborah, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Taya. I really appreciate it. So, Deborah, at the commission, we get information requests, like literally every day, from people asking for help in looking into the wartime service of a family member. So we're really happy to be speaking with you. So let me do a couple of scenarios, and maybe that'll lead you into explaining to people how this can work. In scenario one, my grandfather served in World War I, let's say, and I know he was in the Marines and went to France. Where do I start? Well, if you're super lucky to have an ancestor who served in the Navy or Marines during World War I, you have a really straightforward path to doing research. If your ancestor was in the Army or the Air Service, that's a totally different story. There was a disastrous fire at the National Personnel Records Center in 1973, and we did lose about 18 million official Army and Air Service and Air Force military personnel files from about 1912 to 1964. But there's a really great foolproof way that you can start your research regardless of what branch of the military your ancestor may have served. Go through what you already have. It sounds very simple. It sounds very elementary. But go through those old trunks in the attic or call the relatives who have the older photographs, the medals, the uniforms, the postcards, and go and examine everything. This is the time to bring them out. Get your smartphone out, download some of those apps that allow you to scan them effectively through your smartphone. So go through all of those photographs together as a family and start talking about what everybody remembers. If you don't have any of those family heirlooms, you're not alone. All you may have had is a story that's like grandpa served in France, but even that's a great place to start. If you have that information, you can start going through things like Ancestry, Fold3, an internet archive, or even the National World War I Museum and Memorial online, and you can start doing your research there. Okay, so in scenario number two, let's say my grandmother drove an ambulance in Italy. She wasn't a soldier. She was a volunteer in 1916. How do I start with her? If they were starting off as a volunteer, I always tell people, again, go through what your family already has. And from there, branch out into things like newspaper articles. But also remember that women served in a lot of different capacities with a lot of different lineage and civic organizations, YWCA, the Salvation Army, the American Red Cross, Colonial Danes, Daughters of the American Revolution, the National Federation of Women's Club, and also women's labor unions. All of those organizations kept archives. You just have to find it at that local chapter level. Women's efforts were also extensively documented in the World War County Honor Books and the state histories documenting the World War. And a lot of them are online and they're free. They're online through Happy Trust and they're online through Internet Archives. And sometimes you can find them on Google Books as well. Remember, when you're searching for a title, you're not going to find County Honor Books World War I. It was just called The World War. So you don't want to necessarily add the one into the search. And if you really can't find anything, visit your local library, visit a local historical society, call the local county where your ancestor lived during the 1920s and see if they have a copy that hasn't been digitized yet. 
Now, one of the really cool things about your book is that you also address how to research World War I genealogy for Canadians who were, after all, in the war a lot longer than the Americans. And we have quite a few listeners in Canada. So for them, what's the biggest difference between doing genealogical research in America versus Canada? For the Canadians, they have an ease of access that Americans could only dream about. The National Library and Archives Canada did an absolutely stellar job before the World War I centennial, digitizing all of their World War I military service files, as well as their daily war diaries and petition papers, which is sort of like our enlistment papers. Really, really lovely because it's free and it's searchable. That ease of access is a wonderful thing, but there's also really great collections at different archives that are around, like the Ontario archives have a wonderful collection of regimental photographs. So there's a lot of help and a lot of support for people who are doing great war research, and it's very straightforward. Okay, in your experience, where do people get stuck most often? The question that I get when people come into the library are, did their ancestor even serve? We don't have any uniforms. We don't have any medals. We don't have any photographs. So I always tell people, let's start at the very beginning. And the easiest thing that you can do, at least for a man, go to the 1930 census. In the 1930 census, there's a column, column number 30, which asks if the man from that census was a veteran. If they served, it'll say yes. And then in the next column, it would ask, what war did you serve? And there was an abbreviation. This is great, not just for World War I research, but all types of research. If you look and see a WW, then you're like, oh, well, there's a story here. I can move forward. So let's go see what we can find. When I started my research, I only had two lines. Grandpa Rhodes fought in World War I. He was an ambulance driver, and he never talked about it. The amount of people who say he or she never talked about it is very, very common. People wanted to forget this really awful situation and this really awful war experience that they had been through. If you don't belong to some of these online websites like Ancestry or Fold3, you can still get them for free from your local library or your local family history center. There are people who will be so excited to see you and will want to help you every step of the way in your research. There's a lot of options for people who maybe didn't necessarily get a lot of information, but it doesn't mean that just because it looks like it could be difficult that you should just give up. You just have to have a curiosity of going out there and uncovering new information that maybe you didn't know before and helping document your ancestors' experience and helping to put their information up, whether it's online through the World War I Centennial website or documenting that for a local newspaper article you don't have to be a genealogist to do that. Well, that's, that's really great advice. It sounds to me like I'm going to have to get your book. <laughs> <laughs> what made you decide to write it? I was really, really excited when I kind of thought about the centennial. I thought back to what we had as a family. And as I was doing my own research, I'm like, I don't want people to start at the same place I'm at. It seemed super difficult at the time that I was starting. But once I kind of sat down and organized my thoughts, I said, I'm going to write something that anybody can follow. I want to start them off at square one, and I want to give them a step-by-step guide to getting the best success and the best return on investment. You know, the more people are able to pass on accurate information about where people are, where they went, what they experienced, we don't fall into that pitfall of myth that kind of builds around wars that don't have really good documentation. Well, Deborah, your guide's going to help a lot of our audience connect with their heritage, so thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Deborah Dudak is the author of the book World War I Genealogy Research Guide, Tracing American Military and Noncombatant Ancestors. Learn more about her book by reaching out to us on Twitter at the WW1 Podcast. That's at the WW, the number one podcast, or follow the links in the podcast notes. As a direct follow-up to our interview with Deborah, once you found out about your ancestor's service, we have a wonderful thing for you to do with the information. We can offer you the opportunity to post what you found into a permanent national archive to be preserved by the U.S. government using the Stories of Service feature on our website. There are three parts to this. Part 1. Go to ww1cc.org slash stories. 
where you can post your ancestor story and pictures for everyone to read and enjoy. It's easy to copy and paste your information into the form. Now, it may take a few days for your story to go live, especially as the volume of submissions rises, but it will get posted and it will be archived. Part 2. On that page on the left side, click on the link that reads Stories of Service and explore some of the other great posts. At the top of that page, there's a search box just for Stories of Service. And see what you can find. Try typing something like 42nd and you'll see all the related stories posted about those who served with the Rainbow Division. Part three is to check out all the other good genealogy resources that you'll find here, including links to additional articles, a really great connection to Roll of Honor, who's a partner adding these stories of service to their veteran profile pages, and lots more. You know, the living history of Americans who've heard these stories directly from a grandparent or a great-grandparent is fading. But every day, people are finding diaries, letters, and other treasures that tell the stories of service for those who answered the call a hundred years ago. We'd like to invite you to help preserve your family and our national heritage. Get your stories of service preserved as a part of the American experience for future generations through our stories of service at www.cc.org stories. You can always contact us via Twitter at the WW1 Podcast. And of course, we also have links for you in the podcast notes. Moving on to our 100 Cities, 100 Memorial segment about the $200,000 matching grant challenge to rescue and focus on our local World War I memorials. This week, we're headed to Socrates, New York where the Lamory Hackett American Legion Post 72 has built a World War I Centennial Room as a permanent exhibit to commemorate the town's World War I veterans. Here to tell us about the project are Bill Payne and Vince Bono, members of Post 72, and Lisa Polay, a member of the community who's been helping with this project by doing the exhibition design and writing the grant application. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sam. Hello, well, Saugerties, New York, well, that's sort of mid-state near Albany, isn't it? Uh, Saugerties, New York, is uh, located on the Hudson River, 50 miles south of Albany, about 100 miles north of Manhattan. Uh, Saugerties is a Dutch word that means from Dysagertai, which means the little sawmill. About how big is it? Saugerties population, 25,000 people from the villages within the town. So how big was it around the turn of the century, around the start of the war? It was a bigger population than I would think. There were many factories. and I believe it was about 9,000 people. Oh, excellent. The town really does have a very rich history. Tell us a bit more about it. From the point of view of the shared military history that this town has got, people from this town served in the French and Indian War, the Revolutionary War, and the Civil War. Service continued, of course, in the Spanish-American War, and we had a large population of soldiers who served, and many who fell in World War I. The post is named after Adelbert Lamery, and Patrick Hackett. That reflects the Huguenot background and also the Irish background. They both died in the big offensive in October of 1918 against the Germans. They were in the 77th Regiment and the 27th, both National Guard units. So they were very close to the end of the war when both of them fell. And when you built this centennial commemoration room, can you tell us a little bit about it? What is it and what am I going to find there? Our post home, which we acquired in 1951, it's an old building, well over 100 years old, it was a home. In about 1982, we decided we would put in a museum of military service. So the Centennial Room had actually not been developed as a part of the exhibit until now. We have artifacts that were brought back by the World War I veterans from Saugerties. Some of them are captured items from the enemies, and many of them are personal items of the soldiers themselves. I was very impressed because they really have a lot of material that's intact and in very good condition. An aviator's uniform, right. and, uh, enlisted sailors' uniforms, combat uniforms with helmets and gas masks. And we've and got the information about the gentlemen who wore it, and their portraits right. hanging next to them. So were all these artifacts something that you found locally in the town, or how did you find them? From about 1982 onwards, we had a lot of World War I veterans still living, and they brought them in. There are very few items that have not been donated by local people. Mm -hmm. Just about all of them really were. Certainly everything really in the Centennial Room is local. 
But I think what was most interesting were those letters and that project that had been commissioned from the state archives. After the war, they had sent out surveys asking the veterans or their surviving family members to fill out what their experiences were in the war. And it just so happened that the pastor, who was the town historian at the time, was almost finished with the project, and he happened to have passed away, which meant that the material actually never made it to the state archives. And in the state archives, I believe in 1962 or 63, they had a fire, and all of these projects were destroyed. So we, in fact, are the only ones, just by accident, that still have all of this original material that was collected. We've heard about those forms that were set out before and the fact that most of them were destroyed. So it's really great that you guys have a trove of them. About how many are there? Oh, there's got to be, what, about 80 of them, if not more? We have them in a binder that's probably about six or eight inches thick, Uh page after page after page. Also with some of the photographs of the soldiers as well. We had some very interesting responses. Uh, One that always sticks in my mind is all the man wrote was, I went to hell and came back. That's all I have to say. But we also found scrapbooks that people kept in town of the soldiers. Townspeople were keeping records. Like we also have their obituaries, newspaper articles, and such. With these artifacts that you have and the letters that you have, can you read us something from one of them, just so we get a feeling for what they are? I just pulled out a letter from one of the soldiers, Percy Becker. He actually died not long after he wrote this letter. I'll read you towards the end. We will all be home soon, and we can tell more about France and what we've seen, as we do not dare to write and tell what place we're in or what line we're at, as that's the order and we have to obey them. Myrtle, you wrote and asked me if I wanted any cigarettes or anything. I thank you very much, but I would not send anything if I were you, because maybe I would get them and maybe I wouldn't. Myrtle, tell your husband that I send best regards to him and also your folks and the baby. And when you see my folks, you can tell them I wrote to you from a little soldier boy in France doing his bet. You know, the first person that counts, I mean, they're really good. We've digitized actually all of that. And it's also available here to read them in their entirety. Well, how did you get involved in the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials Project? Bob Chappelle, who's the co-curator with Bill, had approached me and asked me if I would help. Then once we had sat down and met and we discovered all of these letters, it really seemed like a perfect fit, especially since the town doesn't have a World War I memorial, and this was the perfect opportunity to create one. And you also made a video as part of your grant application. Uh, As I recall, it's actually quite nice. Thank you. I felt like the soldiers' words spoke louder than anything that we could say or define about them. So it seemed fitting to just let them speak for themselves. It's sometimes thought that the American Legion is like a closed private club. We are very, very much out in the community. And this museum has become a vehicle, really, for us to reach out to the community, especially young people who are learning about history and bringing them in. We were part of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Unfortunately, we didn't get started in time to catch any of our World War I vets. We interviewed and recorded on video 60 veterans here. We focus on our older World War II vets to start with, from World War II right down to the present into the Smithsonian Project. Well, thank you for all of the great work that you're doing and for working with your community on this. It really sounds wonderful. And congratulations on being part of the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials grantees. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bill Payne, Vince Bono, and Lisa Polet are part of the team behind the Lamaray Hackett American Legion Post 72 World War I Centennial Room Project. Learn more about the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials program by following the link in the podcast notes. And that brings us to our weekly feature, Speaking World War I, where we explore the words and phrases that are rooted in the war. Now, there's many nicknames for each of the combatant nations. The British were Tommies, the Americans, Sammies or Doughboys, the Turks were Jacko, the Italians, Macaroni, and the Portuguese, Pork and Beans. And the Germans were Jerry's, Fritz, or sometimes this week's slightly obscure speaking World War I phrase, Alleyman. How does Alleyman connect to German, you might wonder? Well, it's from our friends in France. 
Derived from the French word for Germany, Allemagne, the Doughboys picked it up and turned it into Alleyman, of course. It was never a popular term, but it does show up again in a song from the 1960s musical, Oh, What a Lovely War, I Wanna Go Home, reportedly based off of a French tune written during the war. It features the use of the word Alleyman and several other speaking World War I terms that we've had on the podcast. Here's a read of the lyrics. I want to go home. I want to go home. I don't want to go to the trenches no more. Where the whiz bangs and the shrapnel, they whistle and roar. Take me over the sea where the alley man can't get at me. Oh my, I don't want to die. I want to go home. And here's the song. Alleyman, one of the many nicknames from the war, and our phrase this week for speaking World War I. We have links for you in the podcast notes. This week, in World War I War Tech, we're taking inspiration from a notice in the July 19 issue of the official bulletin, announcing that a trophy captured by the U.S. Marines during the furious battle at Belleau Wood is on its way back to the United States. Two German Minenwerfer mortars are being sent to West Point and Annapolis. The German Minenwerfer, or mine throwers, represented the modern revival of an ancient siege weapon, the mortar. Think of the mortar as a portable, short-barreled, muzzle-loading artillery weapon. The concept was around as long as gunpowder had been in the West. Well, in 1914, only the German army used mortars. Their Minenwerfer were essentially trench howitzers, fired at an upward angle and were a lot like regular artillery except they were smaller and could be hauled around by a group of men instead of horses. According to historian Bruce Canfield, a British engineer, Sir Wilfred Scott Stokes, took the next step. His design was simpler, lighter, and became the starting blueprint for mortar designs for decades to come. The innovation was that the Stokes model could be handled by a two-man crew, which blurred the lines between artillery and infantry. Once its effectiveness became apparent, the other allies adopted the Stokes mortar for their infantry, including the United States. Each infantry division of the AEF carried 24 Stokes mortars. Dispatches from American units on the ground, compiled by historian Canfield, contained references to the various ways that the Stokes mortar could be disruptive to the Germans. A dispatch from the 89th Division reads, One enemy cannon caliber 88 and its entire crew was cut out of the action by a direct hit from a Stokes mortar. The effect of fire from Stokes mortars and rifle grenades on machine gun nests was very great. The mortar an ancient weapon, rethought and becoming an important part of the World War I arsenal, and this week's World War I War Tech. We have links for you in the podcast notes. This week, in articles and posts, where we highlight the stories you'll find in our weekly newsletter, The Dispatch. Headline, How Doughboys in 1918 Celebrated Independence Day on July 4th in France. Commission intern Joseph Vesper takes a look back at how doughboys all over France observed American Independence Day on July 4th, 1918. Headline, ABMC releases new video about Seren American Cemetery near Paris. ABMC, the American Battle Monuments Commission, has released a new video presentation titled Seren American Cemetery, America's World War I Cemetery near Paris. The video tells more about the cemetery and its history. Headline, Battle of Hamel helped kindle a hundred years of mateship between Australia and the U.S. One hundred years ago, members of the Illinois National Guard's 33rd Division were fighting side by side with the Australian troops in the Battle of the Hamel. 
in June at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, an event celebrated that friendship. Headline, Immigrants Played Big World War I Role for America. Gordon C. Morse, writing in the Virginia Pilot newspaper, recently made the observation on World War I, no sentient American should go about the day without understanding that World War I put in motion the present role of the federal government, the responsibility of global leadership, and the vast material cost of it all. Headline, this week's Doughboy MIA, Private Lee G. Winslow. Private Winslow was a farmer in Fairmont, Indiana, and went to France in May of 1918. Over there, he was transferred to Company E, 2nd Engineers, and was killed in action by shellfire on October 3, 1918. His remains were never identified. Finally, our selection from our official World War I Centennial Merchandise Shop. Our featured item this week is a beautiful album of music, poetry, and emotions from the Great War. It's A Silent Night, a World War I memorial in song. And it's a stirring musical performance from the duo of John Brancy and Peter Dugan. Links to our merchandise shop and all the articles that we've highlighted here are in the weekly dispatch newsletter. Subscribe at ww1cc.org slash subscribe. You can also send us a tweet at the WW1 Podcast and ask us to send you the link. And that brings us to The Buzz, the centennial of World War I this week in social media with Catherine Akey. Catherine, what do you have for us this week? Hey, Teo. I wanted to point everyone to two really great videos shared on Facebook this week. The first comes from the 79th Memory Group, a reenactment association based out of France that commemorates the history of the U.S. and 79th Infantry. They recently collaborated with another French living history group, trains and traction, riding the rails in France on restored World War I rail cars. You can watch the video of the 79th Infantry riding through the French countryside on a period train car and follow the links in the podcast notes to learn more about these two different French reenactment groups. Secondly, and last for the week, as part of the World War I centennial commemoration, the U.S. Army Center of Military History is putting out seven informative video episodes about World War I. This series details America's involvement in the war, from the causes that led to the United States entering the war, through the final battles and aftermath of the peace treaty, and is a collaboration of the U.S. Army Center of Military History and the Defense Media Activity. Watch the first episode at the link in the podcast notes. That's it this week for The Buzz. And that also wraps up episode 80 of the World War I Centennial News Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We also want to thank our guests, Mike Schuster for the Great War Project blog, Dr. Edward Langle, military historian and author, Deborah Dudak, author and guru for World War I genealogy, Bill Payne, Vince Bono, and Lisa Polay from the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials Project in Saugerties, New York. Catherine Akey, World War I photography specialist and line producer for the podcast. Many thanks to Mac Nelson, our wonderful sound editor, and World War I Centennial Commission intern, J.L. Michaud. And I'm Teo Mayer, your host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was created by Congress to honor, commemorate, and educate about World War I. Our programs are to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I, including this podcast. We're bringing the lessons of 100 years ago to today's educators and their classrooms. We're helping to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. And of course, we're building America's National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. We want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as the Star Foundation for their wonderful support. The podcast and a full transcript of the show can be found on our website at ww1cc.org/cn. 
you'll find World War I Centennial News in all the places you get your podcast, and even using your smart speaker by saying, play WW1 Centennial News Podcast. The podcast Twitter handle is at the WW1 Podcast. The Commission's main Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC, and we're on Facebook at WW1 Centennial. Thank you for joining us, and don't forget to share the stories that you're hearing here today about the war that changed the world. So long.